conscious that being a member of Parliament is a leasehold and not a freehold. That I serve at the pleasure of my constituents and the people of North East Somerset. And therefore, at every election, it is starting afresh. And there is an absolute democratic right for people to change their mind. And it is my job at every election to persuade people, to encourage them, to appeal to them, not to change their mind. And I will begin by saying a thank you for allowing me to have this great honour of being your Member of Parliament. There is no greater honour that can be given to your fellow citizen than to ask him or her to go and represent you in Parliament and to hold in trust for you that power that is yours about how your lives should be governed and the laws that should be made. And I'm very grateful to have had that honour for the last seven years, and I hope that you will think that I ought to continue to have it for the next five, although now we know the Fixed Term Parliament Act doesn't apply, for whatever period the Prime Minister decides. You all know that Edmund Burke famously said that your representative owes you not only his industry, but also his judgment. And this often gets taken in terms of representative uh, government to mean that you only owe your judgment. But that's only part of it. You have to look at the whole of what Edmund Burke said. The industry part is important too. And I think as a member of parliament, I have done my best to be as industrious as possible. And a lot of that is local work. Margaret and I, my agent as you know, do a lot of work locally for and on behalf of constituents who come to us with problems. We haven't met in this village hall, but we've met in many of the village halls across North East Somerset. And that work is essential to being a member of Parliament. It's very rewarding. Out uh, today campaigning, a lady came up to me who has got her PIP payment through finally after an appeal that we supported her with after a long drawn out process. But it's also at the heart of what you do and how you set out being a member of Parliament. Because I take the view that as a constituency member of Parliament, I am there as the champion of my constituents, not as their judge. So that when people come to see me, I'm deeply conscious that I am their last resort. They have been to everybody else. They have been to every other source of help they can get. And then finally they come to me. And that's why when they come to me, I strongly take the view that it's not for me to judge whether their case is well-founded or not. Whether what they're asking for is reasonable or not. Whether I actually believe them or not. I am there to take up their case with as much vigour as I can to back them because nobody else has. And that, I think, is at the heart of being a Member of Parliament locally. That is the industry bit of what Edmund Burke was talking about, making sure that you are available to help constituents in difficulties. And I would add that that is also the greatest reward that you have as a Member of Parliament. I'll come on to the big national issues because they are unquestionably important, interesting and exciting. But when you get, as we got to the office, somebody had sent us a plant because we'd helped this lady overcome a difficulty that she felt nobody else was backing her for. My team in London are deeply touched and moved by that and you feel that you've had a good day in the office, that you've achieved something for people, as I say, who have nobody else to help them. And I want, obviously, to continue doing that work, to continue holding regular surgeries and being available to my constituents. <coughs> the judgment part is where you face the big national issues. This is what is going on in Westminster. This is the speeches in the chamber, the questions, the work on the Treasury Select Committee, the work on the European Scrutiny Committee. What we do on those committees is hold the powerful to account, to ask them the challenging questions. Some of you may have noticed that during the Brexit debates, the Governor of the Bank of England and I did not invariably see eye to eye 
uh, on matters pertaining to his economic forecasts. I slightly feel that I'd be more right than he has in the time since then, but it's not a question about uh, I told you so. It's a question about being there to hold authority to account, to ask the difficult questions, and then by your votes, to vote in the national interest. Here, I am the champion for my constituents and for North East Somerset. In Westminster, I am not, again to quote Edmund Burke, an ambassador representing one nation against all the others. I am joining in a national enterprise for the good of the whole country. And when I am in Westminster, yes, of course, I am elected as a Conservative. And I would expect, in the routine course of events, to support the Conservative whip, to vote with the Conservative government. And I will further confess that, since it's been a Conservative government rather than a coalition government, I've been a much more reliable supporter of that government, which may be reassuring to those of a Conservative uh, turn of mind. But I'm there to be loyal, but I'm not there to be a cipher. If I think what is being done is not in the national interest, or is to the major disinterest of my constituents or to North East Somerset as a whole, then I must raise the difficult questions and ultimately vote against. So that is how I have been your Member of Parliament and is how I would hope to continue to be your Member of Parliament if I get the support that I am asking for. But we have great challenges in this general election campaign, some of the greatest that we have faced for generations. And that, of course, is how we deal with Brexit. And this has come into an even sharper focus over the last 48 hours. Over the last 48 hours, Mr. Shushanka, the Commission President, has allowed briefings to go out to a German newspaper expressing his determination to be very tough in the negotiations. Now, I don't think that's unreasonable. I think when you go into a negotiation, you don't go in saying, well, I'll give away whatever the other side wants. It'll just be all very nice and we'll agree everything and we won't ask for anything in return. Foolish way to go into negotiation. And why should I expect of others that which I would not do myself? But in return, we need to be tough. We need to have backbone. We need to set out very clearly what we want and how we will not automatically accept what they tell us is good for us. It is not 27 against 1. It is 1 against 1, because the 27 are united in the European Union, with whom we are negotiating as a body, and we are 1. And that's very important to remember, because when you hear it's 27 against 1, you think, well, they might outvote us. No, no, they can't. It has to be agreed between us. When they say the basis for the negotiation must be that we will discuss what they want to discuss first, no, it doesn't work like that. In a negotiation, you decide jointly what you both want to discuss, and then you go through the issues at a time agreed by you both. We start with an equality of negotiating strength, with an equality of position, with no side having a greater power one over the other. And we also have, in the process of the negotiations, things that both sides want from the other. To put it at its crudest and simplest, what they want from us is money, and what we want from them is free trade. And I think there may well be a negotiation, a settlement around that, but we clearly know what we don't want. We don't want something that means we are still in the European Union at the end of the process. As Mrs May said, Brexit means Brexit. That decision was made last June. This election is not about reopening that decision. It is about who negotiates on our behalf to get the best deal. And what have the Labour Party and the Lib Dems said in the last 48 hours? They basically rolled over in front of Monsieur Jean and had their tummies tickled. Their essential view is that they should give way at the very first point, at the very first obstacle to whatever he has asked for, and have said that Mrs. Mayor is being obstinate for not agreeing to it. Now, is that an intelligent way to enter a negotiation? To my mind, it shows they're unfit to lead the negotiation, and is why it has to be done by Mrs. Mayor. But as I came into this room, 
just talking to a few of you as I arrived, people were saying to me, and they are right, that this election is not only about Brexit. Brexit is important, and Brexit is probably in reality why this election is earlier than anticipated. But there are the key other factors to consider, ones that apply at all elections. We still have a deficit of £50 billion pounds a year. The Conservatives got into government in 2010, it was £150 billion pounds a year. And as the economy has grown, the reduction in it is slightly better in real terms than the headline figures indicate. But £50 billion pounds a year is still a huge amount of money that we are spending that we are not raising. We happen to be the fastest growing economy in the G7, or we were uh, in 2016. And that achievement hasn't come from nowhere, that's come because of the sensible policies that we have followed. But we have to be intelligent about how we continue to manage the economy, and we have to continue to bear down on expenditure and on the deficit. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Diane Abbott's interview today. About <laughs> I hear a heckle, I love being heckled, and the heckle was a gentleman, a councillor in the third row, that he doesn't listen to comedy. Well, it was a great comedic effect. Mrs. Abbott, who is a very intelligent and capable lady, didn't seem to know the difference in the interview between 2,500, 25,000 and 250,000. So she told us that there would be 25,000 extra police a year, which would be an enormous number. Then it became 250,000 a breath or two later, and that this initially was only going to cost 300,000 pounds. <laughs> well, I know that the police are very good value and they provide such a wonderful service, but the labourer is worthy of his hire, and I don't think the police are really going to ex accept that you get those numbers for 300,000 pounds. It then went up to 80 million pounds, and I think the figure is about 300 million pounds, which doesn't really matter because it encapsulates the lack of seriousness that they have about their economic policy. They make uncosted spending promises that sound lovely. We all want more police on the streets, but we're just more realistic, more competent, more down to earth about what can be afforded. The same is true about the um, bank holidays. I mean, who here wouldn't like another bank holiday? Yesterday was delightful. It was a lovely day as I went to Newton St. Lowe and Priston, both of which have wonderful May Day fairs. And I've done this every year now for years with normally increasing numbers of children, but um, actually, <laughs> you know what's like. Um, uh, but those are days when the economy ceases to be productive. And you've got to pay for the public services that we want. And we all still want an NHS that is free at the point of use. And if you are to have that, you need the money to pay for it. And you need the administrative competence to make it work structurally. And that is what you get with the Conservatives, and is what you don't get uh, with the Labour Party. And we also have to consider, for the first time actually in a number of general elections, the issue of national security. I think North Korea is a threat. We know what is going on in Syria, particularly uh, with ISIS rather more than with Assad, is a threat. And we know that Putin is erratic, to put it perhaps at its politest. Do you really want us being represented on the world stage by Jeremy Corbyn? I don't say this because I think he's a bad man. As it happens, I think he is a good man but I think he's so utterly unrealistic in how you deal with evil. And I think that's a very strong word to use, and I use it deliberately because when you're thinking of Kim Jong-un, that is real evil. A man who goes to such lengths to murder his brother. A man who thinks up bizarre ways to murder people who have worked for him man who threatens world peace by his development of nuclear weapons. Assad is in the same category. By those standards, Vladimir Putin is the sort of chap we'd like to invite to dinner, but he is nonetheless a dangerous figure 
because of his desire for Russian nationalism. And we need somebody strong, somebody who can have the confidence of our armed forces, somebody who can have a strategic vision to consider how we deal with those challenges. And we know who that someone is. We know who in all of our minds is the only person capable of the party leaders currently available of leading us with strength. And that is Theresa May. So my appeal today, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you, is to once again ask, beseech your support. And it's right that I should do that. I love our democratic system that means that Mrs. May has to ask this of the people of Maidenhead. Jeremy Corbyn has to ask it of the people of Islington. Um, I have to ask it of the people of North East Somerset. But we all have to go and ask it from our own communities because it is our communities coming together that give a majority to one person or another to lead our country. But I know even more than I know that I want to be re-elected that the only person who is capable of leading our country in these very difficult times with difficult Brexit negotiations, with present economic circumstances and with global crises facing us, is Mrs. May. So I hope I can count on all your support so that I may support Mrs. May.